everyone. So we continue. And this time I have Melissa Box here. And she's a very interesting lady. She's an agile coach. She is a deep agilist in her head. She's a leader. And she wants to share with you the complexity of agile leadership. And we have this chat in the backstage together with it. But I didn't share this one story, which I'm going to share with you. So when I hear this question at my trainings or during coaching assignments, like, can you tell me something about Scrum values? Then I usually have like the first association, Melissa, Melissa, <laughs> Melissa. And then I like pause and then I usually say, oh, those are those. But you know, I need to share with you a story about this wonderful lady. So enjoy the talk, Melissa Box. Thank you, Zuzi. Um, this is normally the time that I would say how awesome Alex was and to give him another round of applause. So we'll pretend that we're doing that um, for a moment with some snaps, um, but awesome, Alex. And thank you to Agile 100 for having me here today to tell a story. So I want to start very, very quickly by just kind of sharing what my path has been. This has been my career for the last 12 years or so. Um, this talk isn't really about me, but I wanted you to understand where I'm coming from and what inspired this topic for me. Um, you know, I went from QA manager to Scrum Master and then years of agile coaching into my current role, which is the co-CEO of Scrum Alliance. And that last, those last two circles represent a really significant shift in my thinking and in my growth. And I'll tell you why. Um, I was a really big proponent of agile leadership, as Dizzy mentioned, um, living my values and helping others to live theirs is probably one of the most core things to my character and to my personality. I was very guilty, especially as an enterprise coach, of saying, well, if only the leader could get on board, or if only the leader you know, understood agile. And you hear it all the time. You know, almost every organization that you would go into as a scrum master or as a coach, it's always, well, how do we get leaders on board? How do we get leaders to be more agile? And 18 months ago, when I took this job, I began to understand what we were really asking of people and how it's not as easy as we might think from the outside to just say, oh my gosh, I wish the leaders would just be more agile. And so I share my path because I want you to understand that sort of no matter where you are, I probably have been there or can relate to you. And I'm very fortunate for that, but along the way I've learned some things. And so if you are you know, a, a team member, a QA manager, a scrum master, a coach, I'm hoping to help you understand a little bit more about what we're asking the leaders to do when we are asking them to just be more agile and just change the culture or just live your values. And if you're one of those leaders, I want you to know that I understand how complex that is and maybe help you develop a couple of things that you can kind of evaluate yourself and, and find where some of that is happening. So this is a story about collisions. And I use the, the analogy on this slide of, of neutron stars. When neutron stars collide, they either merge together and they form this new larger star or they collapse into a black hole. And I'm not a scientist, I don't pretend to be a scientist, but I love this analogy because what I'm going to talk about is how sometimes even your own values can collide against each other. Even if they're the most agile of values, they create this paradox in your mind as a leader and you have to make decisions. And sometimes it's this competing against yourself. I love this quote from Peter Coleman. He says, see the system. When you find yourself stuck in an oversimplified, polarized conflict, a useful first step is to try to become more aware of the system as a whole to provide more context to your understanding. There's a little bit more in the quote, and then he says, it is a critical step toward regaining some sense of accuracy, agency, possibility, and control in the situation. 
So what I wanna talk about um, is when your values collide. And for the purpose of the talk, I'm gonna use my values. Um, I define my three values as courage, empathy, and creativity. Um, I'm gonna talk about mine, but I'm gonna ask you as you're listening and kind of processing to think about your own and to think about times when your own values might be colliding and you're actually having to make a decision either between your values or later we'll talk about how to commingle them. So let me start first with courage. So we talk a lot about, you know, as agile leaders, you have to be cur courageous to be vulnerable. You have to be courageous to um, kind of allow less than perfect things to happen, um, freedom to fail, the, the whole nine yards. Um, I can talk about a time when I had to act on less than perfect information in my organization. And that's a hard thing to do already, right? It's a hard thing to say as a leader when everyone's looking at you and expecting you to have the answers that I really don't know. I don't know if this is the right thing. And then at the same time, there are always going to be people in your organization who question those decisions, right? They say, well, why did you do that? Or why was that important? Or I would have done something differently. And those people are super important to you as a leader, right? Those people do help catch you because you don't have perfect information. But what happens when those two things collide? When you know that there's a decision that you have to make, you don't have all of the information, and you have an incredible sense of empathy for the people who are asking all of those questions and you don't have any answers. It's really a struggle um, because all of those things are good. Them asking the questions are good and your courage to move forward and act on less than perfect information is good, but there's a battle raging in your head in that moment. Um, similarly, the courage to accept responsibility for your organization, for the value that you deliver, for the way that you are run. But at the same time, you have empathy for those who want more out of your organization. They want you to move faster. They want you to deliver more. But sometimes when you are relinquishing control, that means you're not just relinquishing control of the ideas, you're relinquishing control of how those things unfold. Um, and if we think about you know, organizations working in an agile way and trying to deliver incrementally, you know that you're relinquishing this control, that things are going to come out in slices. So people are going to get more value more quickly, but it's not necessarily, they're getting the whole thing as fast as they'd like. So once again, you have these competing things in your head, these competing values, and you have to decide either, am I going to pick one? Or am I going to learn how to commingle them and how to really act on both of them at the same time? My next set of competing values are creativity and empathy. And so we always talk about, you know, being more agile means approaching problems differently. And at the same time, having empathy for those who are learning to work in a new way. And so your excitement and your creativity around, you know, how we might do this differently, or let's get rid of that program completely, or let's, um, you know, completely re-envision how we're going to do this might be really scary for people who are still learning to work that way. And so as a leader, you're, you have both of those things in your mind. And before you even begin to approach those problems, you're weighing, oh gosh, you know, I have all these ideas. I think we have ways that we can come to this problem, but I also know that this might be, you know, jarring or, or people are just trying to process how to actually work. You know, for instance, if an organization is new to Scrum, you have all these ideas to approach problems differently, but they're still just figuring out how to do sprint planning. And so you have to learn how to actually kind of bring those things together. Um, rather than having them compete. 
um, similarly, but not exactly the same, is you have all these ideas and this creativity around how to engage with your organization, with the people in your company, but many of them are scared because you are bringing to the table this new way of working and they don't always know how to operate inside of that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the why around that later. Um, but very similar to the other one, it's, you know, how do I balance engaging with them, giving them more choice, giving them more autonomy, but without kind of furthering their fear, because I have so much empathy for, you know, I was that person at one time, you know, 12 years ago, Scrum was new to me. And so I know how scary that can be. And so how do you balance those things or kind of bring them together? The last one, creativity versus courage. So the creativity to create this flexible, responsive org structure and the courage to relentlessly pursue the vision of the organization. Now those don't at first glance seem like they are polarizing, right? They don't seem like they're competing with one another. But when you think about it, it's sort of similar to um, some of the creativity and the empathy where I'm going to relentlessly pursue this vision, but sometimes creating a flexible, responsive org structure means that initially things are going to slow down. And I'll speak specifically to organizations that are um, either publicly traded or have, you know, a, a board of directors or they have very um, invested stakeholders. Those are big things to balance. And, and the courage to not only pursue the vision, but help all of those stakeholders understand that we have to slow down a little bit to speed up. That's quite a, a collision between those two things. Um, and similarly, creativity to create choice where it is not normally present, to give these self-organizing teams the autonomy they need to move forward, but also back to accepting responsibility, but really relinquishing control. I mean, once again, you are, I believe it's the right thing. You know, I believe in, in the agile values, or sorry, the agile principle that says self-organizing teams produce the best stuff, but it also, man, I'm gonna have to have a lot of courage to relinquish that control because ultimately I'm the one who is responsible. And so you've got this, this collision once again. As I was kind of working through some of these things in the moment, and then again, when I was putting this together for you, it occurred to me that a lot of those collisions in my own head weren't just about me and they weren't just about my organization, but they were about things outside of me. And so I began to kind of recognize like it wasn't just my system that I had to look at. And it's not just your system that you need to be aware of, but that we are all systems inside systems. And in this particular case, what that means is the value collisions that might be going on inside the leader's head, those are not the only collisions. A lot of the things that I just referred to were because the societal expectations of a leader are sometimes in direct contradiction to what we perceive as agile leadership. So often society looks at leaders and expects you to have all the answers and expects you to maintain control and expects you to um, not give so much choice, but rather tell people what they should do based on kind of our historical view of what a leader is. So you've got these like internal collisions that are they are yours, but they also are kind of a result of these overall collisions that are happening between sort of our new movement of what we think leadership should look like. And even your own team or the organization that you're working inside of as a coach or scrum master, they may have very different expectations. So I have definitely had times where, you know, I feel like I'm doing the right thing by giving people choice and giving them more autonomy, but if they're not prepared for it, 
and they, there's not structure for it, then I'm not doing any of us any favors. Then I'm kind of, I always use the phrase, you can't put people in a canoe and push them into the ocean without creating structures that support them so that they feel safe to make some of those decisions. And so um, this is not a fully definitive um, description of agile or traditional leadership. But I just wanted to kind of give you some idea of some of these collisions that happen. You know, we talk a lot in a lot in agile leadership about decentralization of decision making, where traditional leadership would expect you to delegate. We talk about value delivery, where traditional leadership talks often about productivity, incremental planning versus long term planning, leading of teams versus managing individual performance balanced decisions between you know leadership and teams and those who are you know right there with the customer versus top-down decisions and if you think about some of the collisions that i was referring to with the values it's because of this greater collision that some of those things are taking place in my head it's because i i recognize and i have empathy for my teams who may have fear or may not have the right structures to be able to make the decisions that that we were asking them to make. And so I just want to point out, like, we haven't certainly haven't figured all of this out. Um, I'm kind of sharing with you mid story as we work through some of these things. But I think it's really important to recognize those internal and external collisions that are happening so that you can then create those structures. Um, and so what I'm sharing here is many of you have probably seen this. It's from Richard Hackman's book about leading teams. And it kind of delineates almost like a maturity of self-organization. And so often when I would go into an organization and people would say, oh, I wish the leader was more agile. Often it was about the culture and it was about autonomy. And so people want autonomy and people want to make decisions, but they also need to feel that they're supported in doing so. They need to feel that there's accountability, that there's a purpose. There needs to be balance between the leader kind of crafting a vision and setting context and then allowing them to kind of get customer and stakeholder feedback and make some decisions. They need to have the depth of knowledge to make those decisions. It, this is the part about like putting someone in a canoe and pushing them out in the ocean. It's literally, it's not fair to ask people to make decisions if they don't have all the information they need to make those decisions. Uh, it's about empowerment. And I, I hesitated to use this word because I think so often empowerment is an overused word. And also we don't always use it correctly, meaning people intrinsically have power, but empowerment looks like actually setting the context and saying inside this context, I am going to be okay with whatever you decide. And I can tell you as a leader that it's hard to create the context and then it's hard to let that go, but you absolutely have to. So if I say that, and then I come back and just upend whatever, you know, the team did within that context, then I have just completely set them back into living in fear and, you know, living in a place of like, I don't know how to work this way. Like you told me that I could do this. And when I did it, then you told me you didn't like it. And so it's not just empowerment. It's like the combination of all of these things, context and empowerment. Um, feedback loops are still really important and being really strategic about them so that all of those other things remain true. And then granularity. This one's big because this kind of refers to Hackman's um, grid over here where he's talking about like the different things, the granularity at which teams can make decisions and at which management needs to make decisions. And I can't tell you how important that granularity is, especially if the societal expectations and, and what employees might be looking at it as might be different from yours. So being very specific about context. 
and the granularity of that context, you know, saying it's okay for you to spend money up to this point, but anything over that, we need to have a decision or discussion. Um, you have decision making authority up to this, but beyond that, there's, you know, a risk to the organization or there's exposure. So we need to have that conversation together. That kind of granularity is really hard to kind of figure out. It kind of reminds me of like, when you're first trying to, as a team, get on the same page about story points. And I know not everyone uses story points and that's fine, but you know, it, it takes a little bit of back and forth to figure out what we both mean and to figure out what that threshold is. And the more that you can be really specific about the granularity of the context, even the granularity of the accountability, um, the more likely you're setting people up for success and you're not setting yourself up to have to go back in there and go, well, that's not what I meant. Um, you know, the decision made was too big. And again, you don't want to go back and like take that away from people. Um, none of this is easy. And so this is when I come to like the complexity of it all. When we go in and tell leaders, oh, you just need to be more agile, give people more choice. If we are not aware of the structure and system around that, then we could be as coaches, as scrum masters, setting that leader up to make things even worse. So it's really important that we understand the system that we're in, that they're in, and all the factors that are kind of um, playing into that. So this is one of my favorite ways to talk about agile leadership, which is that Leadership begins with the alignment of personal values and organizational values. So if you are a leader, it's incredibly enlightening to really sit down and think about your own values. And in doing so, think about your organization's values and make sure that those things align. And when they do, then you're able to live those on a daily basis. And I love using the analogy of, you know, I go in, I would go into organizations and say your mission statement, your values have to be a whole lot more than just a plaque on the wall. You have to actually live them. And I think the same goes for the leader is it agile leadership specifically calls us to a deeper, more complex relationship with those values and really understanding what do they mean to me? How do I take my values in the light of all of these societal expectations? How do I create structure that allows our organization to live those values, allows me to live my values, and then I can actually like let go of some of these things and let them happen because I can trust that we're all pointing in the same direction and that we know what it means to do that. So I want to talk a little bit then about some of my examples from before and what it means to actually co-mingle some of these things and instead of having to decide if i've created the appropriate structures within my organization um, such as decision making clarity you know you have decision making power up to here here we need to talk about it together and here actually i just need to make the decision when that's really clear then some of the people that I was referring to with the empathy pieces, they have some um, safety in that, you know, that creates security. Um, the, in, in the particular case of my organization, when the product owners know that the, the backlog belongs to them, but if, if things go beyond, you know, their particular community and it is it kind of exposing the entire community or the organization, then that's a conversation that we need to have, then they feel safer. And then therefore, I feel the ability to be more courageous, or to be more creative. When I'm having the courage to do those things, and I'm being transparent and open about it with the organization, and I'm talking about, hey, we have these structures so that we can step out so that we can be braver and you know do the things that we believe are really going to delight our customers 
And I know it might be a little scary, but you can trust these things. You know, you can trust the things that we have built. Um, in our organization, it's even things like um, we have a, a storytelling channel, we have a gratitude channel, we have communities of practice, we have a notion of sister teams where two teams kind of work together. All of those things intended to create safety and help people understand who we are as an organization in order to allow us to be more brave. So these are all ways in which I'm, I'm building structures that allow me to actually take these values and bring them together rather than them being like a constant, you know, collision in my head. I can't do a whole lot yet about the external societal collisions where, you know, um, the world expects something different from leaders, but I can onboard people in a specific way. You know, when we hire someone or even in the way that we hire, when we show them from the very beginning that we're different and that you're going to be not only empowered, but expected to be courageous here, then I'm creating a, a, a safety in them. I'm helping them to see the collision before they even get there. You may have an expectation that, you know, your manager is going to tell you exactly what to do, but that's not how we work here. You know, I'm identifying the system and identifying the collision within the system as they're walking in the door. And in our case, even through the way that we hire. And so it's all about creating a way for these things to commingle. And so, you know, the, the question then is now what? What do you do with this information? I think whether you are a scrum master, an agile coach, whether you are a leader, a CEO, a manager, we all have these collisions. And so taking the time to really recognize, you know, in a quiet moment, but even in the middle of a conflict, you know, even when you have a big decision to make and you, you recognize like something's going on and you can't figure out what it is, you might ask yourself, what are my values? And are my values having a moment right now? Are they colliding? And I need to recognize what's happening. And also, is the way that I want to lead right now colliding with what society expects of me? Or the way that I'm asking this leader to lead, is that colliding with what is expected of them, either from their boss, from their stakeholders, or even the people that they lead? And just acknowledge it and talk about it and figure out what needs to be in place in order to leverage those things together. And that kind of goes over to the second side, which is around like aligning expectations and creating structures and seeking feedback to continually talk about that. Because the thing is with collisions, it's not always solved that first time. You know, if I recognize that like I figured out my own collision, but I'm recognizing that, you know, what I'm trying to do right now is colliding with what my team expects. And I, I believe it's the right thing, but I need to help them understand why. Then continually aligning those expectations and being really open and transparent about the why is the way that you help those things leverage together. And it doesn't always happen the first time, but after a couple of times of saying, no, it's okay. I do want you to make this choice. You do have context. I trust that you can do it. And whatever you do within, you know, two and eight in terms of um, here's your boundaries, I'm completely okay with. If you've done that enough times, at a certain point, they're going to begin to trust that. And you can move further down your agile leadership road. So that's what I have for you today. That's my story around collisions, around courage, empathy, and creativity, and the complexity of being an agile leader in a society that doesn't necessarily expect it and your own internal collisions. Thank you, Melissa. We have two questions so far. So okay. please write our questions into the chat. Let's start with the first one from Pete. 
What values did you find most in conflict when joining guiding the Scrum Alliance? Um, this is me personally, um, but I often have found empathy that I is a part of who I am and is a very strong part of who I am to be in conflict with almost anything I ever wanted to do for the organization. And, you know, I'll acknowledge that a little bit of that is just fear. Um, but, but it does come from a place of empathy where like, I recognize that courage, creativity, even agility, you know, has an impact on people. And ultimately, of course, I believe it has a positive impact on people. But sometimes when you're in that messy middle, you know, the empathy can uh, be overwhelming at times. Because you know it's hard. Yes, I know. All right, another question from Elena. Coaching in agile practices uh, works so much better when the team is well designed in the first place and not so much if it isn't. So is that consistent with your experience is the first part? And the second part would be, what is a leader's role in designing a team and let it be self-organized? Um, can you say the first question again? Uh, is it consistent with your values that coaching in agile practices works so much better when the team is well-designed? Of course, absolutely. Um, I think it's important to acknowledge that that design evolves as well. Um, but absolutely when a team is well-designed and they have everything they need, they have the information they need, they have the skills they need. That's the only way that it works, you know, um, but also the recognition that over time, those needs could change their end users or their community or whoever their stakeholders are could change. And therefore what they need can change. So yes to that. And then the second question. Uh, what is a leader's role in designing a team and let it be self-organized? You know, um, if I brought up my slides again, I, I think I would point back to the um, the Hackman model and how he talks about the difference between, you know, self-managing, self-governing, et cetera. It, it depends, I think, on the organization and it depends on the structures that are already surrounding the team. If we're just talking about one single team, absolutely the leader has a role in helping whatever this new team is in whatever context understand their purpose um, and, their, and the vision of what they're setting out to accomplish. And then creating whatever structure is necessary for maybe them to design it together with the leader. But again, I think that really varies on just the rest of the organization and, and back to those societal expectations. Like if the people that are coming into this new team aren't equipped to design it, they don't have enough information or they don't have enough context, then it's almost not fair to ask them to do that. You know, you need to be able to share what you can so that all of you are successful. Yeah. We have a question from Sohraf, right? <laughs> It says, uh, thinking about the organizational change you did within the Scrum Alliance compared to the other organizations you worked in your past, how would you compare it? Ah, uh, um, hmm. Faster. <laughs> um, and I say that because I, I acknowledge what we do all say, which is that organizational change happens faster if the leaders are on board. That's absolutely true. And in our case with Scrum Alliance, um, I'm the chief Scrum Master. My partner is Howard Sublett, who's the chief product owner. And both of us were very aligned about what needed to take place. And a good amount of the members of our team were aligned about what needed to take place. That doesn't mean it was easy. Um, so, I mean, I would compare them and say, we certainly moved faster than some of the clients that I had gone into as a coach. Um, but that has its pros and cons as well. You know, when you move really fast in organizational change, there's definitely a kind of a, a change fatigue and a ripple effect. And so that's something that has to be kind of monitored really carefully. Um, we also were able to move fast because we're not a huge organization. You know, we are, 56 people across seven teams and 
really our belief was if we can't do it now, then we'll never be able to do it. You know, you should be able to kind of change and move a small organization like ours with the support that we had from the community and from the board of directors and from each other. Um, so faster, smaller, and we didn't try to plug and play anything. So it's important to note that we're not using any specific framework except Scrum. And so as we're, you know, there's all this talk about scaling and for some organizations that's important, um, you know, that type of structure that, that you can kind of rally around. But for us, we are very intentional about being organic with what our organization needs. And so I think that's another thing is we're not using anything but Scrum <laughs> to guide us in terms of structure. And when you do such a change, there is a site uh, question in that one, right? At the organizational level, what is the role of the board in that change? Oh, gosh, that's, um, I feel like that's the eternal question is what is the role of the board in, you know, a lot of things. In our particular case, the role of the board was one of support and guidance. We came to the table saying, you know, we've evaluated the organization and our vision and where we want to go. And this is what we believe needs to happen. And we showed how it was aligned with the agile values and principles and our scrum values. And the board was very supportive. They asked the right questions, sometimes challenging questions. Um, but ultimately, they respected the fact that we are in it every day. And I mean, I was so thankful every step of the way that we had that level of support and respect, because I know that's not always the case, um, you know, at every company. Mm -hmm. I have a personal question to you, because I'm really like thinking, what are you the most uh, proud of the most, like for your past year or two or three or five? It doesn't have to be like last year, right? But uh, what is the thing which you are the most proud of? Oh, that's, um, you know, I'll go back to the collisions. I'm obviously talking about this because this was a very personal thing to me for the past year and a half. And I'm proud of the fact that despite those collisions, I learned to work through them and to still be courageous, even with, you know, empathy for our team for whom this was going to be challenging empathy for our community you know who kind of had to be a bit patient with us as we worked through it you know i had tons of empathy for for them and i'm i'm quite proud of the fact that we we were so strongly rooted in our values overall and our belief that our organization deserved joyful, prosperous, sustainable, you know, just like every other organization that we try to, to help in the world, that that was more important um, than my fear and than the collisions. And I needed to figure out how to like blend them together and, and move forward. And I believe we've done that. You know, it's not perfect by any stretch and we're still working on it, but um, it's taken a whole lot of, deep breaths and acting on less than perfect information and relinquishing control and trust. And so, yeah, I'd say that was it. It was just overcoming the, the fear. You have an interesting history, right? You've been an agile coach. Uh, you've been before the manager in the organization and now you are the CEO or co-CEO level. So what was the biggest difference taking the executive level again after being an agile coach? I think the biggest difference was what, again, what this whole talk was based on, which was I had been a manager, I had been a director, and yet I didn't, when I became a coach and I was asking leaders to do things that I still agree with. I'm not saying I would have changed any of the coaching that I did. I don't think I had an understanding of what I was asking of them. 
and I didn't have, I had empathy for sure, but not enough understanding of what I was being empathetic toward. And that is this complexity. That is this constant collision in your head of, you know, is this right or is this right? Are they both right? Hmm. Um, so just that, that knowing, that understanding. Um, I have a very specific memory very early in our change when we were doing a very kind of challenging workshop. And, you know, we have coaches that help us at Scrum Alliance, certified enterprise coaches and a certified team coach. And I'm in a room with them and, you know, things are a little bit chaotic. And one of them, I don't even remember which one said to me, look, Melissa, all you need to do is this. And I remember ha like having my head in my hands like this and looking up at them and going, this is a whole lot harder for me than it is for you. <laughs> and I've been in your shoes and I know where you're coming from. And I know that like in a way it is simple, but it's not. And here are all the things that are going on when you say, just do this. That moment, honestly, I think that's the moment. It wasn't the moment that I stepped into these shoes and began, you know, as chief scrum master. I think that was the moment that I recognized like, wow, I have for probably at that point, three or four years now been saying, oh, just do this. And it's not that simple. You still need to just do it, but it's not that simple. Yeah, I love this. I remember <laughs> that. Um, I have one more question for you. You mentioned coaching, right? And you mentioned uh, certified team coaches, certified enterprise coaches. Can you elaborate a little bit about the value of coaching in the organization? I could not have done what Howard and I have done in the last year without coaches. Um, without coaches to kind of um, stand by us and help our team work through both the structural and very logistical things, helping them learn, deeply learn Scrum and deeply learn Agile values and principles. And just to kind of be there and say like, hey, you know, we've been here before and it's doable and you guys can do this. You, you all can do this um, and to coach us because there have definitely been moments like that one I was referring to where, you know, they're coaching us as well. And I've been doing this for a long time, but not in this capacity. And so you can be a coach. And then if you step into a leadership role, you kind of have to balance what you know about coaching, but actually being a leader. And there have been times, um, even Howard, actually, my partner will say, you know, Right now you're a leader, not a coach. And you can definitely blend those things together and, and blend those skills. But once we actually, when we had coaches with us, I almost could let that go. You know, I knew that I don't have to coach because they've been there too. I know we're aligned. I know that what they are going to work with my teams about is the same thing that I would. And so as a leader, you can't be everywhere all the time. And even if you're, and I'm still working on this, but even if you're an extremely ag agile leader who's got it all figured out, you're one person. And so having them to go and be that mentor, that coach, that, that teacher has been the thing that has made this work. Wow. Nice words. It seems to me we can stop here. Uh, thank you very much, Melissa. It was very inspiring uh, talk full of uh, nice wisdom. I'll need to still sort it out in my head. It was really awesome. <laughs> thank you so much. And I just remind you, there is a coaching clinic, so you can get help from those wonderful coaches. So just click on the networking tab, and there are a couple of them waiting, so you can have a nice conversations. We give you a slightly longer break, about nine minutes, and we start at uh, the full hour. Great. Thank you. Bye, everyone.